Yo, what's up, podcast? Welcome back. My name is D Mac. Welcome to D Max Podcast. Uh, today we got Wes on the episode, and I met my guy in China, and he's a super, super cool dude. So we're gonna we're gonna get right to it. Wes, go ahead and introduce yourself, bro. Um, Wesley Perryman, aka Wes. Everybody just calls me Wes. Um, born and raised Boston, Massachusetts. Um, played basketball. And, High school, college, pro, all that good stuff. And now, you know, I'm running my own business out here in California. So ready to get this going, man. Let's 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 chat. Let's talk it up. Got you, man. Got you. So I want to ask you how what got you started playing basketball? Like when you was younger, what who did you have like a big brother or like a role model or somebody that put the ball in your hands? Or how did you get started hooping? So I would say like just being around family, man, you know, like being at the cookouts or being in the in the backyard and having a Hoopers know the little crate that was on the tree. Yeah. My brothers and uncles and them used to hoop on that little crate, and I would just sit there and watch. I was always really small, so I would just watch and want to um, want to participate, want to play. And I think them just seeing them play, seeing how fun, uh, how much fun they had, um, it made me want to start doing it. So I think that's when I first like really got involved with it, like wanting to compete and play. Yeah, yeah, and and so yeah. playing and you played through high school, right? How was your high school experience? High school, um, high school was fun, man. Some of the, the the most fun times I had, like when I was a, I was a, I was on a freshman. I was playing JV, um, just getting a feel for it, um, and, and just being around the guys, you know, being around all of my teammates, some of my best friends. We all went out to try out and all that stuff. So it was it was good times. And then um, just wanting to wanting to compete against the varsity guys. They were so stacked though. Like, they had a stacked ass squad, man. I just wanted to compete against them. So, I used to go to their practice and I used to like tell the seniors, like, y'all play you one on one just so I can show the coach that I can play them too. But, you know, he still didn't give me a spot on the team. So, I played JV my first year. And then um, I came off the bench for varsity my sophomore year. And then I think that's what started to spark, you know, coach wanting to just let me play, play. Um, we had, we had uh, Will Blaylock was one of our main guys. He went to the, to the Detroit Pistons. So we had some some tough talent that I was trying to compete against, and that's why I had to kind of wait my turn, you yeah. know. So, so yeah, but it was it was fun, man. I, I I did my thing. Sophomore year, I, I came off the bench. I started to make the newspaper articles, um, Boston Herald, um, Boston Globe. Um, so I started to bring those newspaper articles home, put it on the fridge, show my mom and everybody. Junior year was my breakout season. That's when I took over the city, man. I was I was uh, I started to get ranked. Um, I was rated like number one point guard in the state. Um, and we, we started to win and we won the, uh, the championship city championship. Um, and then that's when I started to get offers and, you know, uh, interest from colleges and stuff like that. So high school years was, was some of my best years, man. That's when I, that dog in me started. So you must've went to like a really good high school. Was your high school always good or y'all just had some good players during the time that you was there? Um, we were, we were always competitive. The, I don't know if you know about Boston, but the team that was, the team that you wanted to beat was, uh, was Charlestown. It was Charlestown. Them dudes won the state championship like every year. We used to get on a train. We all had to take transportation over there in the East Coast. There's a bunch, a bunch of trains. We had to take the train and these dudes would be on the train. As soon as our stop would open up and we like get on, you'll see them with their varsity jackets, their championship jackets and East Boston and you know they we it was a big rivalry that was our rivalry and they won every year so me coming out of middle school um I didn't want to go join that team I knew how they were in the city I was like I want to play against them you know what I mean like I had I didn't mention this but like Kobe's my guy Kobe's my favorite player and he was a competitive dude and I I, I was all about just like wanting to compete against the best wanting to play against the best and they were the best so going up against those dudes man they ran the city like legit, they ran the city. So, I, 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 my thing was just practice, 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 get the team better, and compete against them. So, if you can beat Charlestown, you you did your thing. We was we started kicking that butt junior senior year. So we had we had a good team, man. We had a lot of guys um, that could have went D one, but that street life they got caught up in that street life, so they didn't really go. They they didn't make it to college. They didn't they didn't get offers. They didn't get the grades. They didn't graduate high school. Um, all that stuff. So we had a good squad, man. We we like I said, we beat we won the city championship against Charlestown. So for me, that's the biggest win in my life because I hated that team. 
that's big to win the city. Not too many people they can say that they 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 actually you know won city. So that's that's that is a big deal. Yeah, and and that team was going on smacking everybody. Like they they had uh, they played a full court press, man, and one of the craziest press that you, it it they would be in teams by sixty and seventy in the city, and I was so fast and quick they couldn't trap me. So I kept running from it. <laughs> so like once the coach was saw that I could, because usually you want to break a press with like passing it ahead, get it to the middle. I was breaking that thing by myself. So he had to take that press off. And once we broke that, that it was over. They, it was hard for them to like try to just, they couldn't smack us. Now it was like a real game because he had to take the press. It wasn't like telling you not to dribble through the press. Cause if I'm a coach now and I tell my players don't dribble through a press. Don't dribble. Exactly. <laughs> so how your coach was cool with you doing that? So he um coach six, he's one of the first coaches to let me go, man. Like he, he let me play. He just let me play because he trusted me. Like I gave him I uh, like he, he gave me the benefit of the doubt. I didn't make a lot of mistakes. Like you if I'm dribbling through a press and you can't steal it, you can't tell me not to. Like I was that good at getting through the press because I was so fast. I wouldn't recommend this to my kid. I coach too. I wouldn't tell everybody, hey, break it because you can. But I had like no choice. Our team had no choice. Coach had no damn choice but to say, Wes, we need you to like get past this the press. Cause it was that hard, man. They they were they were athletic. They had these dudes probably had the most D1 players out of the city. Like, have you, you know Shabazz Napier? Yeah. He's uh Plays for the he played for the Blazers. He played he plays everywhere in the NBA. Um, he played for Charlestown. Um, they had Tony Lee, who's one of the all time greats out of Charlestown. Will Blaylock, Ridley. Uh, they had so many people who played D one and either went D one or went pro after that. And um, they they had all. It was almost like the Warriors when they got KD. They had a stacked team. You know what I mean? So. I that's what I did, man. I was just breaking that press. I kept running through it. They couldn't stop me. And then once I got over half, we just ran a set. But no one could get through their press. So I just used my athleticism, man. But yeah, beating them was like dream come true for me. Yeah. yeah. So what happened after high school? Uh, you, you By the sound of it, you was pretty good and your school was pretty good. So did you go straight to a D1? Did you go Juco first? For me, man, I grew up. I grew up in, in the hood. Like I grew up with like the street life. So I was always around it. Everybody knew I was the hooper from the hood, but I still was affiliated with the stuff. You know what I mean? Like being around gang members and all that stuff. Like that's just how we grew up. Like there's no way around it unless you move to the suburbs. And moms couldn't afford that. You know what I mean? I grew up single parent household. My dad died when I was little. So like we was always in the hood. So for me, I got caught up in that. So when I was a senior, I had probably two classes to go, bro. And I dropped out. I dropped out of school. I said, F school, man. Like, I don't even want to do school no more. Um, I want to just go work and make money. I had a kid while I was a senior. Um, so I was one of them stories. You know what I mean? Like the dropout with a kid at a young age. Um, so it was stacked against me. I was supposed to fail. You know what I mean? Like I'm not supposed to be on this podcast. I'm supposed to be like in the street, still by the corner, drinking some, uh, some Henny bottle. Right. Like that's what the stats show. Um, but after a couple of years, you know, just working, taking care of my child, doing all that stuff. Um, I'm in the city in these leagues and I'm cooking motherfuckers. Like I'm still killing all the best players. Everybody that went college, came back, went pro, came back. I'm lighting everybody up. And word got out to a school in New York City, Monroe College. They're known for, you know, they're a Juco, but they're known for, like, basketball. Like, they were ranked and all that stuff. So they, this dude, uh, Coach Erickson, I will never forget this dude, man. I still hit him up to this day, like, thank you, dude. Like, you changed my life. He calls me on the phone. He's like, he's like, um, I know you don't know me, um, but I, I just heard you still playing basketball. I heard you used to play. I heard you can still go. Um and we would like to have you come out here to the school, check it out. I was like, man, honestly, dude, like, I don't even have a diploma. How am I supposed to get over there? He was like, listen, I can try to help you to get some night school. You do night school, you can get a diploma, you can try to go to school. So my first step was doing that. So I go, I go to night school. Man, I'm in night school, bro. And I'm like, man, this is whack. I wanted to quit. I wanted to, I just, I was like, I was comfortable with living my lifestyle. So I'm in night school. I had like an English class. 
And I'm going to tell you about the other class I had, man. You're going you're gonna to be like, what? So I had this English class. I'm there. I, I'll kid you not. The biggest thing that made me stay in that class was this girl. It was this cute girl in the class. <laughs> and I kept going because I liked her. She was cool. So I was like, yeah, I'll be in class on Tuesday night. Like, just because she was there. So she, she made me want to go. So I went. I banged that out. I got that done. And the other class that I needed was art, bro. My coach um soon turned principal to school he was my my coach until my sophomore year then we switched and to got another coach that coach coach Ruben he became the principal I hit Ruba I'm like yo I need an art class it's all I need I can get my high school diploma help me out he's like listen Wesley this is what I'm gonna do Mr. Perryman he's called Mr. Perryman this is what I'm gonna do you come up here we got the hall the whole hallway you paint the whole hallway with this art stuff they gave me you paint the whole hallway we'll give you your art class I was like, you going to make me paint, bro? <laughs> so I go paint. I, I was painting that shit the whole week, and I got my art grade. And then they gave me a legit high school diploma. So I got that, talked back to the coach. He was like, all you got to do is you come out here, play against this team. It was in the Bronx, a little hole in the wall in the Bronx. And I go out there. They give me, they, they uh, got me a train ticket. And he was like, we just got to see you play. You play well, we can give you a scholarship to go to this school. Man, I got in that gym and lit every motherfucker up in that gym like there was guys from yonkers uh brooklyn queens you know it's new york you know how new york is down so they they see me they're like this boston kid let's kill him i was lighting them i was this is when i was dunking everything athletic as hell so i went in there killing as soon as the, the it was over coach was like listen we love you you'll fit right in with us um it was talking to their sophomore kid like hey this is going to be our guy next year. He's, he's coming in. You guys are going to kill it. So even he, the, the, the sophomore kid who was the best on the team, he was even welcoming me like, bro, you got to come here. So I, I ended up signing in, man. I, I got into the school. They gave me like a little $500 a month stipend. Um, my financial aid pay for everything. And they gave me like a little, uh, little scholarship that they could offer. And that kind of changed everything for me. Like I went from, you know, being out of school for a couple of years to going there and I got there as a freshman, and I, I was just balling. Like, that was all I had. I knew if I failed at that, I was going to go back to the street life. And I think that's the difference with what with, with, with some of the kids' attitudes that I've coached these days is that, like, if they fail at basketball, they got parents who are going to, like, take care of them. They'll be all right. You know what I mean? They're, you know, And I don't want no offense, but, like, that's just reality. They know, like, hey, I got something to fall back on. My mom owns – my dad owns – everything <laughs> my mom has this like i got a room in the house i can't go back to my mom's crib she'd be like get out of this house like you can't live here <laughs> you're too grown you know what i mean like i didn't i didn't want to go back to the streets either like being in the streets you you never know you watching over your shoulder everywhere you go you just don't know who who wants your your new hoodie who wants your new sneakers you know what i mean i was like i, I can't go back like i can't go back so every practice every game I left it on the floor. I was like, I got to get a school. I got to get an offer. So I'm killing everybody. And that's when I started to get like some, some interest from schools like uh, Northeastern, uh, Rhode Island, Providence. Um, now I'm like, D1s is hitting me up. I'm like, all right, cool. So nothing real serious. No, no scholarships, but just like, we like what we see. Keep going. So I'm like, all right, I need an offer. So after my freshman year, I got rookie of the year, MVP. Um, I broke all the records. I was a thousand point club. I was going off. Um, and the coach let me go. He let me play. He knew like there was no holding me back. He tried one game to take me off the bench because I had an attitude at practice. I had 30. He was never did it again. I was just like, none's gonna stop me from making it. So my after my freshman year, I had no offers. I was like, bro, now you feel like you got that sophomore year. After that, it's like, what are you going to do if you don't have no offer? So I'm going to my freshman se- my freshman summer, and I had a, a showcase out in um, like Nebraska somewhere, some somewhere I've never I've never even been before, and I had a, I had a showcase for the top hundred players in the nation for JUCO, and I get to the showcase, and um and I almost didn't get to the showcase, man. I know I'm rambling about this, but like this was another big thing in my life. I get to the airport, JFK Airport. And I had an expired license, right? I go to the front, dude, and I, I this I needed to get to this to Nebraska, <laughs> like wherever it was. At, I needed to get there, and I get to the dude, and he's like, um, he was like, "Well, we can't use this." 
I was like, man, I have no other proof of like ID. This is my license. It's all I have. He was like, well, it's expired. You can't get on the plane with this. Bro, I go outside. I'm about to start shedding tears because this is all I got. So I'm like, damn, what am I going to do, man? Like, I'm sitting on, I, I kid you not, everything I love, I'm sitting on the curb outside the airport. And I'm like, damn, I'm not going, I'm not going to be able to make it. Like, I'm not going, I have nothing. I call my coach. They, nothing they can do. They're like, we may have to come pick you up. I was like, fuck that. No. So I walk in. I'm in there. I'm like, I'm looking at the dude down there. <laughs> I walk all the way to, the, I see this, like, I see this other lady. And she's looking at stuff. She's like, oh, you know, she's more quick. She don't really care. She's just, I'm watching her. I'm observing all this. Because I'm like, I got to get in this this plane. So I'll go up to her. And, <laughs> and hopefully this doesn't get out to her. She get fired. But I go up to her. And um, I was like, you know, just acting normal. I give him my son, making sure he don't see me. He's way down the other end. Like, it's far. So he, I don't think he sees me at this point. And she lets me on, bro. I'm like, yo, that's God. That's got to be God. She lets me on. So I get on the plane. I go out to the showcase. We get, like, five games. You've been in the showcase. I know you've been in them. And you know everyone's trying to do them. Like, it's, it's me, Mac, Tony, like, Matt get the ball, Matt shoot, and everything. Like everyone's trying to score. So I'm like, yo, I gotta, I gotta stand out. So every time I had the ball, I had to run the one to facilitate, but they saw my speed, my quickness. Um, I was scoring, I was dunking, I was trying to do everything. So when I'm after the first couple, the first day, games are over. I'm walking outside, I'm walking to the my car or whatever. Um, well, no, I'm walking to like a shuttle bus because they were gonna bring us to the air, uh, to our hotels and stuff. And then um, the uh, the coach from Houston, they can't talk to you. Like they're not allowed to like come talk to you. He's walking next to me. He's like, "Don't look at me. Don't look at me." But we want you. We're gonna offer you after this is over. Don't look this way because we can get in trouble. And we're just walking like this. And I'm like, "I got you, coach." And I committed to University of Houston. That was my first pick. I just committed. I was like, "I don't care. I'm going." I like the University of Houston. I've I known about it. I knew about Hakeem Olajuwon. I knew about Clyde DeGlaude. I knew the history behind it. So I was like, say less. And the coaches, African-American coaches, in my opinion, let you go. They let you play. So I was like, I need that. I need to be let off the leash. I can't do the organized, too structured thing. You know what I mean? Where I got to run all like these sets and I'm not able to kind of get loose. So I was like, that's going to be a perfect fit for me. So I chose that school. Sure enough, time go, a month goes by, clearing house doesn't clear my stuff. I'm like, bro, what else? You know what I mean? So clearing house doesn't clear my stuff. But in that same, that same showcase, Boise State was there. And Boise State offered me. So I go on a recruiting trip. I'm like, Idaho? Let's go check this out. I ain't never been around Idaho. I ain't been to Idaho. I ain't been out west ever. I just been on the East my whole life. So I was like, let me, let's go out here. So now I'm going into my sophomore year and I go visit uh, Boise State. Bro, I fell in love. I loved it. Like, I loved the team, the players. Everybody was from different places, California, uh, East Coast, everywhere. The coaches was cool. Um, the, 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 the city was all about the team. Everywhere I went, they were showing love. It was like, and again, coming from the streets, like, everyone's not as welcome. And they're not like, yo, what's up? Hi, how's it going? You know, good job you know it's not like that it's like what's up what you looking at you know what i mean it was different vibes so i was like oh yeah i signed so i signed after that sophomore year they came to check me out i practiced some of my games um then i killed it in, in sophomore year as well at juco um and then uh that's when i after that i went on to boise state and then that started my career from there but juco man I said high school was one where I started to like really they let me go. My JUCO coach, Coach Brewstead, Coach Erickson, those dudes, man, they let me like they let me play. They didn't hold me back. Um, they had to reel me in. I was a real like aggressive dude. Like I I played with my heart and my sleep. I was real emotional. You know what I mean? Um, so I would get texts and stuff. <laughs> so like they always had to reel me in, but they let me they let me play. A lot of the plays were ran through me. And my sophomore year, we had um uh eight d1 guys like eight of us were division one so we had a we had a team you know what i mean i averaged 20 kyle averaged 20 we had other guys average 16 15 i don't know how it worked but we was all balling and you. everybody went on to play d1 you. during when you got to your juco because i know some got because i've coached juco before and we yeah and like 
you know, took some years off and then they decided to go JUCO, but then they start to struggle with like academics and, you know, being on time to practice and stuff like that. Oh yeah. Good question. School, was it like hard for you to like get through your classes and, and actually be a student again? So, um, it was hard in the sense of just transitioning from the high school level to the college level of the academic side of things. But like I told you with basketball, like, it was all I had. I knew if I failed at that level, I was going back. And I didn't want to work a nine to five. I was too young to be working a nine to five where I knew I had talent that can make me go to school and, and get school paid for. I was smart enough to like recognize that. A lot of youngins don't, they don't recognize that, you know, bro, you have talent to go get school paid for. Take advantage of it. Block out girls, block out all the negativity, block out any distraction, chase that dream. You know what I mean? Like people don't take that, take that as serious enough, you know? And I, I, again, for me, I was smart enough to just like take it serious enough where it's like, all right. And I had, I had an OG who I used to work with, who was working at the nine to five with me. He was like, dude, you are good. Like go play basketball. And God rest his soul. He actually passed away, man. Rest in peace my names. But like he, uh, he, he kind of pushed me to like go play. I had a lot of people in the city too saying like, yo, you can go to the NBA. Yeah, everybody tell you that if you can hoop it. You can go to the NBA. So all, I kept hearing all that stuff everywhere I went. Like, yo, where you play at? You play in college? And I was always like, nah. So um, I, I just, I just, you know, listened to, to that stuff and actually was smart enough to just know like, okay, focus on your grades, focus on your academics. I actually wanted to do well. I was getting C's in, college, in high school. You know, it was like, it was, it was like, Hey, get a 2.0. You can play in a team. I was like, I bet. Let me get that 2.0. <laughs> that was my that was my mentality. Whereas when I got to college, I was like, yo, I need that four. I want to go for 4.0. I just want to like impress myself. I want to impress my mom. You know what I mean? I got like a 3.4 or something like that. But for me, that was a 4.7. You couldn't tell me otherwise. So I just focused. I, 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 of course, I'm in college. I got my own room. Got my own crib. I'm still messing with girls and stuff. But I still was mature enough to like, Hey, I'm gonna see you after I finish homework. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or better yet, like, yo, want to work together? Like, let's get our work done. You know, that was my energy. Um, because I wasn't messing up. I wasn't. I wasn't gonna get kicked out of no games. I wasn't gonna get kicked off the team. I was gonna drop out of school. Like nothing else was affected. I, I looked at it as like God gave me a second chance. Like He gave me more than two chances. You know what I mean? So I was like, let me make the most of it. So I just, I just locked in and focused. So after you years and you got to Boise um how was that experience like was the practice schedule different than what you was used to like did y'all do a lot of weight room lot of, like 6 a.m like how was how was plan d1 how was that compared to juco so for all the youngins i'm gonna look you right in the face for all the youngins who 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 think like you know one they think college is easy to get to i don't care if it's d1 d2 d1 naia whatever they think it's a breeze, right? Everyone can go. Well, there's a stat that shows everyone doesn't go. There's only so many D1 guys. You know what I mean? It's really hard. Don't let don't let the the, the memes and the goofy jokes on NBA players fool you. Don't let all – like, it's hard. And everybody that's trying to get to that level is working hard to take your spot. And the coaches don't give a damn. If Mac is better than West at that level – and we've recruited West for 10 years and him for one, he's getting that spot because he's better. That's They don't care about nothing else. So that's one thing. Two is um, the transition from either high school or JUCO to, to, to D1 college is night and day. JUCO, we didn't even lift weights. You can low-key, like, not even lift. It wasn't as disciplined. You know what I mean? Some of us just had it in us to just do it. You know what I mean? But it wasn't like... And it may have changed now. This is years ago I played at Juco. It may be different now. I'm pretty sure the coach – they've won so many championships since I left. Like, the coach is probably a lot different. But um, but the 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 way we were going about workouts and stuff, we had our, our practices. We went hard at practice. Um, and then that was, the, that was it. You know, school, practice, games, travel, stuff like that. Now, let's fast forward to going to D1. I get to college. I got 5 a.m. workout. I'm like, you want me to get about four? What? Like, who does that? The world is sleeping. So I'm up at four, 
having a hustle to, uh, hustle to conditioning. And you think conditioning because it's at five, it's a breeze. No, you're you're running, running. Like we're pushing, we're pushing plates. We're on a field. You ever see football, a D1 football stadium? We are, we are, we run into bleaches 25 times. Like this is in the morning while everyone is knocked out having the best dream of their life. We're hustling up and down. We're, like it's, it's crazy. So it goes from, you know, no workouts. I mean, no uh, weights and all that to like now you're in a full, you got a strength coach. So your coach drops your ass off at the arena or better yet, you walk your ass over there. Coach is done. Now it's your strength coach. Big, they're always big. Let's go. Like, and they are on something every morning. (laughs) He, we called him a coach, uh, a Sarge. Sarge, that was his name. Short white dude, big, strong, like, strong strongest dude i've ever met in my life and he was the older cat too and og was strong and you did not say nothing back if he said give me 40 you gave him 40 and you shut up and you did it so that was the energy i didn't have coaches in my face like that um strength wise like conditioning it was more so like practice like getting on me at practice this was you know you got your conditioning so we we we, we uh and, and, it, and it's, it's, it's so cool because you start to see how the pros operate. You know what I mean? Like, we get in there, we got a, a real warm-up. We got a real stretch. We got a real um, – we got an actual workout plan that we all have to bring our paper to see, like, okay, what are we working on? Mac may need to be improving his agility today. So we're going to work on his lower body. Wes's upper body is weak as hell. So he needs to focus on this. So everything was kind of, like, personalized. So I'm like, yo, this is dope. You know what I mean? Because Trey, who's one of my best friends, he's strong as hell. He don't need to be doing what I'm doing. I need to get my arms up. He needed his legs look like sticks. So we were kind of doing different things sometimes. We're like, we needed to focus on things a little differently. Or someone had an injury, so we catered to that for, for him. But it was like, it's done more like, you can see it's more at a pro level. It's at, it's at a high level. So it's like a big step up. So we have our conditioning. We go through our workout. After you finish your warm-up, you got your workout. You finish your workout. You go outside. Now you got your conditioning. This is all happening every morning. And if it's not the morning, it'll happen later in the day before you have. Because some of us had class in the morning. We were like, we they didn't make us go to uh, conditioning. We had to go later. So you would have your, your workout. Then you would have your conditioning. Conditioning was always something different as well. Every time you check your your little sheet, it was always like you got to go on the inside, the indoor stadium today, and you got to do uh, sprints or you got to do um, some type of other condition, some band work, all that kind of stuff. After you finish that, you got class. So we had class or, you, you know, you shower, you get to shower in the gym and all that kind of stuff. Then you got class. If you go to class, you know, we were locked in, do our thing. In class, you had to sit in the front. Like our coach made sure they sent a manager around, make sure that we were sitting in front of the class and you can act tough all you want. If you're not in front of that class, you're going to run a hundred suicides, the whole team. So the team hates you if that happens. So we're all in the front. Like I'm not messing around with that. I don't want to be that guy. Show up at practice and Wes wasn't in class. So I'm going to give you a story about that too. It wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't me, but we're, so I'm in front we all, we all get in front of class. The manager runs around. Um, uh, <laughs> Bryce was his name. He's corny as hell. And he always poking the door and we're like, we always flip him off, but we're always there. After you finish class, you, you, uh, you get to go eat. They used to have, um, like breakfast and stuff for us at their, at the gym, at the arena and all that. So we can eat there for breakfast, but then go to class. So after class, we had lunch and you get the meal swipes and stuff. So we go, we, we eat lunch or whatever. After lunch, you probably get like a little break in between there or some of us had a class. But then after that's done, now you got practice. Practice can go for four hours. Coach don't care what you did this morning. He don't care. They don't give a damn. You better be in shape. Your legs better be working. You better be healthy. You got you got you got practice. So we get to practice. Now you go into to the arena and, you know, we get all we go into the little um, you got the training area. So we're getting all our treatment and stuff, whatever we need. Um, I used to uh, get the heat and pad, put the heat and pad on my, my knees and my legs, you know, get prepared. So all of that's different from what I was at Juco because Juco, you go from the apartment to the gym. You don't got a training room. You don't got this. You don't got that. You go eat how you want to go eat. Um, it was different. So and D1, we got a nutritionist letting us know what we should be eating, stuff like that. We still ate Burger King and all that, but we still had someone to kind of guide us with our health and our, our nutrition. So then we we have practice. After practice, some of us got a uh, class. 
and the rest of us got to go to study hall. You have to clock in the study hall. Coach can see when we're clocked in and when we're clocked out. And you can't clock in and try to dip. You're, you're going to get in trouble. So you got to clock in the study hall. Bro, this is a set schedule. And I legit got a screenshot of what my coach, what he said for the consequences if we didn't do all of this. And that's night and day from Juco. So now that's your that's your day. That's your day every day. You just get acclimated with it. And then you have moments where you get your free your free time. We go out to the clubs at night on Saturdays, Fridays. You know, have fun. But that's your that's your lifestyle, man. And it's it's legit. And you have to be disciplined. You have to make sure you stay on top of your grades. You gotta stay on top of your uh your um your your your, your schedule, be organized, because if you miss something, um you get in trouble. So the story I was going to tell you is one of my teammates, Lashard, he uh, he wasn't in front of the class. He was late to class. And he says something back to, to our coach about it. And if you miss class, that's it. You can't talk back. You miss class. So he had said something back. But we did 88 suicides. Think of doing two suicides. We did 88. He put it. He told he told us, put 88 on the clock. And we did 88 suicides like that's unheard of and Lashard was trying to talk back and we're all at pre- shut the fuck up shut the fuck up like don't we're, we're about to fight him because we're dying now. like we did 88 suicides bro because he missed class mm-hmm. so that and, and then on top of that coach made us run um they got us up at three in the morning and out in idaho there's like hills we had to run hills and coach is driving the truck and uh, <laughs> and we're running. And he's let's go hustle. He's just driving his truck and we're fucking like, this is bullshit. We were pissed dog. So that was punishment with stuff like that. So you, you stayed on top of your stuff, man. It was, it was different. That's crazy. That's crazy. I feel like all the youngest that's watching this, they might second, second, second guess going D1. But you got to go for it. For those guys that's, you know, coming up in high school or in JUCO and they think about playing D1 and, you know, they, they kind of struggling to get there, what advice would you get them to help get to that level? Like, is there anything that they can do to prepare them? Yeah. Like, what would you say would help high school players or JUCO players that are trying to go D1? What can they do to prepare for that? Um, there's so many things, man. Like, obviously, you want to put in your reps. You want to practice, right? You want to get with somebody, work on your game. Um, I personally didn't have a trainer. You know, like, trainers, they weren't around. Like, how we are now, you know what I mean? Like, a lot of us giving back, wanting to train kids. Um, we had our OGs. They weren't trying to train you. Like, hey, let's get up at 7. Let's go work out. It wasn't like that. You know, so for what I did, my personal advice is I studied the game, dog. Like, I watched so much basketball. I watched the the OGs play who were good. I watched the games from varsity. I just like studied the game. And like I said, I was a big Kobe guy and I loved Iverson as well. You know what I mean? Cause I, I, I was skinny and small. So I had to watch Iverson cause of how he was picking his spots and scoring at his size. I was like, this dude's 5'11", 150. How is he scoring 60? How is he competing with Kobe like that? So I watched him. You know what I mean? And then I studied everything Kobe did. I studied his fadeaway. I studied his pump fake. I studied his footwork, his counters. I was like, let me do it. So I, I mimicked everything he did. And the more I mimicked it, the more I could do it. I kept doing it. And I think reps is the, like, becoming talented at something is muscle memory. The reason we can, we're right-handed and our rights are way better than our lefts because we use our right all day. Now, if you use your left as much as you use your right, now you're Kyrie Irving. You're ambidextrous. You know what I mean? So reps is everything. So I would do the same things over and over. And I would be at the court by myself. Oh, fade away. You know, just doing the same thing over and over. Cross your legs. Step back. Stop. You know, like just a lot of just reps and playing. I played a lot. I played against everybody. I played against older cats. I wanted to be around the best players. I didn't shy away from competitive, like, um, competition. Like, if I walk on the court and max the best on the other team, I was like, Mamba, I wanted to guard Mac. Let me stop him. If I can stop him, he's killing everybody. How does that make me look? You know what I mean? And then I score on him. I stop him and score. I'm the guy now. Now you show me that respect. You know, like that was my attitude. I wanted to compete against everybody. I knew like it brought the best out of both of us. If I can make you go harder, you are going to make me go harder. Now we both get better. So if you have somebody you can get with, compete against, 
compete, go hard, challenge each other. You know what I mean? If you go out to a court somewhere, guard the best player on the other team. Compete against them, you know, get better. That's how we all get better is by challenging each other. You know what I mean? So just studying the game is is huge. Getting your reps up and not getting bored with the process. It can be so boring to do a one, like two dribble, um, uh, two dribble crossover shot 40 times. Sounds boring, right? But keep doing it. Watch how much you master that move. And no one can take the ball from you because it's all about getting the ball on the string. Now you can focus on everything else. You ain't got to worry about your handle because you done locked that in place. You know what I mean? So once I started to figure that out, now when I'm playing, the last thing I'm thinking about is my dribble. I'm looking at how, where am I going to go next? All right, so I'm going to get past this guy. This guy is not guarding me. <laughs> like, I'm going to get past him, but what are my next plays? That's my mindset when I'm out on the court. And that's because I worked on so much all day, every day. So you got you to, like, you know, um, get a lot of reps in. Um, I wasn't easily distracted by, by, like, stuff that I didn't care for. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care if it was girls. I don't care if it was parties. Like, if it was hoop time, I wanted to hoop. I wanted to play. Like, I loved the game. You know, and I think it starts there. Like, if you have the love for the game, Coach Mack ain't got to tell you nothing. You're going to do it. Like, I should never have to tell a player to go hard. Because you love it so much, you're going to go hard. You know what I mean? You're going to give it your all. Like, you – I always tell my guys, man, control what you can control. You can control your effort. You can control, you know, um, um, uh, getting up and going to get reps in. You know what I mean? You can control how hard you're working on something. Like, you can control that stuff. You can't control every shot that goes. Like, we all ain't perfect. No one shoots 100%. You can't control that. But what you can control is how many reps you're putting up, how, how much time you're invested into the game. You know what I mean? So, like, it's all about, like, controlling what you can control. And those things, for me, um, kind of helped me separate myself from others. And that's my, I wanted to separate myself from others. If I knew you, you weren't going, did you hear the story about Kobe? And I use Kobe a lot. Cause that's, that's been my guy since I was in sixth grade, man. But like where, where him and Iverson, they just finished, um, they just finished practicing or something like that. And um, Kobe asked Iverson, like, what are you doing tonight? And Iverson's like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to go hit this club. And this is Iverson telling the stories. So I'm going to go hit this club up. And he's like, what are you doing? Kobe's like, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the gym, get some red stuff. And that's what you need to do. Like, I didn't drink alcohol until I was like 27 years old. <laughs> like, I didn't, I didn't drink because I just didn't care. Like, everybody was getting drunk and drinking. I was like, oh, y'all better go drink? Cool. I wanted to go practice. I wanted to just shoot. Like, I, I loved it so much. I was obsessed with the game. And I still am. Like, you see me all day. I'm still, like, posting videos of highlights of the players and Kobe quotes. And I'm still out on the court my old ass, still trying to get these kids 40. I'm going to post that tomorrow. <laughs> but um, I'm still out there, man. So you got to obsess over it. Like, you got to really, like, love it so much um, that, that you know, no one has to tell you to, to, to give it your all. You're going to already do it. You know, so a lot of those things, um, I think, kind of help you separate yourself uh, with going to that next level. Because when you get there, those guys are some of those guys are like me. They think like me. They probably will be even. Well, well, let me rephrase that. Some of them may be as as talented as I am, like same type of skill set. You know, like some can dribble like me, shoot like me, crossover or, or handle like me. Um but what separated us was our mindsets, like our, our mentalities, like, our, okay, he's at this level. How's he going to handle it? Is he going to go get caught up in the, the dumb stuff while he's there? I'm in the, I'm in the gym with the manager or somebody getting up shots. You know what I mean? I, I'm going to get extra lifts in. I know we lift all day. I don't care. I need to work on some more. You know what I mean? Um, our gym was open all day. We had a key card, go get it, go in there four in the morning, two and two, two and uh, two in the morning, whatever. Like, so I'm, I'm in there coach coach they can see when we're in the locker when we're in the arena he's like you were in there at 2 30 what else I'm gonna do I don't do anything but school and hoop yeah I'm in there at 2 30 I, I I watched the highlight of Kobe and I wanted to go work out <laughs> you know what I mean so you got to find ways to separate yourself and I think your mindset is going to always be something that's different so with your with your frame of mind towards basketball and your obsession with it, first of all, I know it's gonna be hard to give it up. Like even when you're getting old, oh, yeah. body like starting to have these small aches and pains, you're like, nah, I'm still playing. But how, yeah. how did you? Because you coach and you train a little bit now too. How how did you transition into? Yeah. Like, 
what made you start doing that? Um, so because I loved it so much, I wanted to give back. I had like, I, it's, it's, it's stuff that I, I probably can't even do, but I, I just, I, I know so much about the game cause I study it so much. Like I, 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 I can separate myself from being a player to like seeing things happen like a coach could, you know what I mean? So like once I started to do that or, or, or notice that about myself, watching so much film, um, knowing that if I, if I ran this set, I, I had a counter for it. If someone cut this off or like, I just knew the game in and out. So I was like, yo, I got a coach, you know what I mean? And I was one of those coaches like, um, Shaka Smart. I, I feel like he's. I watched him in person one time at a coaching convention, and he's real relatable to players. He's relatable. He's personable. He knows how to be tough on you, but then show you love. You know what I mean? And that's what we need. Don't. I, I don't want you to scream in my face all day, and then I do something right, and I don't hear about it. You know what I mean? So like, I'm that kind of coach. I'm gonna be on you. Let's let's get it. But after that. I knew you had it in you. I mean, that's what I was talking about. We got it. Let's do it now. You know what I mean? Like, that's my attitude. And I can relate because I was in your position. I played like where, you're, like where you're trying to go. I did it. You know what I mean? What you're doing now, I did it. There's not many, not many stories you're going to come up with that, that I'm going to be like, uh, I don't relate. No, I relate. I know how it feels. You sat on the bench. I did too. You lost your spot. I did too. You know what I mean? Like, you 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 couldn't get past this guy or you know, whatever it is like i've been in all those situations so i was like I, i'll be like i thought i believed in myself like i'll be good in this position to kind of get back to these kids so i decided once i moved to los angeles that's when i first started coaching um i still played i would get out there and play against the team i still kept going i was like i, I just can't stop so i'm still playing against them and then this generation you got to be able to do it for them to respect you like it sucks you know but it's reality so I got to bust my guys up. I get out there, and as soon as I bust that ass, yes, coach, They, I now I got their full attention. And that's what it is. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes your, your accolades and what you've done in your life don't matter to them that you can't do it. I can't tell them to do a step-back crossover shot, and, and, and I can't do it. So I got to get out there like, this is what I need you to do. Bang, bang, bang. Oh, okay. I got it now. You know what I mean? So and I and personally, I don't respect a lot of a lot of coaches and trainers who came with and talk about it. Like either if you're old and you've done it, I respect you. I give my respect to my OGs. But if you're old and you never hooped and you coaching, I ain't trying to hear you. And if, and if you're a trainer and, and you can't do stuff, I'm not trying to hear you. And I see it. Training is so watered down. It's ridiculous. You probably feel the same way. It's so watered down. Everyone's just trying to get these kids money. But what are you really trying to like? What are you like? What are you? What are you giving back to these kids? It can't be just about basketball. It got to be more than that. What life experiences are you giving them? Are you teaching them just to hoop and go home? Are you on them about their academics, about how how they treat people, what their image looks like around the the, the school? You know, like that stuff is important. That's life stuff you take on forever. My kids to this day reach out to me like, Coach, I appreciate everything you did. You know what I mean? Like. That's the energy that I want to see. And I see a lot of watered down coaches out there. Got guys dribbling balls through boxes and a hundred cones and, and skip to my lose. And all. like, why are you teaching them stupid stuff? You know what I mean? So I'd be personally one. I want to put on a, a, a YouTube, me going around cooking all the trainers out there. So I can be like, this is your trainer. That's the, you know, that would be a fire YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> like just cooking trainers but um but yeah um I just I, like for me as a coach I the only struggle that I think I, I had at first was because I can do what I can do like my skill set I've always expected of the player and I had to get out of that mode like this kid isn't me he will never be me you know what I mean he's gonna be him how can I make him the best him and not make him West so I had to learn that in the beginning. I struggled with that because I was like, you can't do that. Come on, man. Like, it's, it's that easy. But it wasn't. I had to slow it down. And then once I got comfortable with that, and I, 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 I noticed that at first, that's why, um, that's why I personally think Kobe couldn't have been a coach. Like, he would expect you to be him. He could be an owner. But he can always speak from that, hey, this is what I, this is what I, you need. But, but I don't think he could have coached a team. He would have been too hard on them. So I had to catch that real soon, real quick. And then now 
I'm just about bringing the best you, like making sure that I'm bringing your, your, your potential out of you and your ability out of you. So um, I, I have to coaching, training, playing, like it's my passion. Somehow, some way I got to stay connected to the game. I, and I see that in you. Like I've played with you before. I've seen you coach before. And I can see the passion when you're talking and you're yelling and yeah. you're playing. I can see the passion on your face and that the passion that you have for the game. And I don't yeah. know, I don't see that in too many trainers and coaches nowadays. Like and like you yeah. know, it's for money. I feel like sometimes it, they just do it for money. It's cause they got the, the they know the right people or they, they didn't play one year of JUCO or something. Yeah. Like, it's rare when you see that passion on people. But besides basketball, what, what other hobbies do you have? Like do you or is it only hoops twenty four seven? No, no, no. So um at first, it was only hoop. That's all I knew. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't care about nothing else. I just wanted to play basketball. But um, I, uh, I'm i such a creative dude, man. I, I, I've always wanted to just, like, express my creativity in other ways. Um, I'm a silly dude, man. I'm goofy and you know, all that kind of stuff. You know how I am. You see me. Um, so I, I've always wanted to just kind of, like, do other stuff. So uh, for me, what I, what I did was start a clothing brand. Like I started, you know, Evolve the Label, you know, go check it out, EvolveTheLabel.com right. website, all that good stuff. Let me plug, let me plug it in real quick, you know, but, um, so I started my own clothing line. Um, one, I, 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 uh, I started off as a psychology major. Um, I'm big on, you know, the way the mind thinks people, all that kind of stuff. Um, but then I switched over to business management. I wanted to run my own business at some point. I just knew like, Hey, I wanted to be my own, run my own business, be my own boss. All right. So um, this is what I came up with, you know, just I wanted to do clothing. I, I love fashion. I'm into the fashion stuff. Um, it's a way for me to, like, express my creativity. Like, I sit at home. <clears throat> I draw my designs. Um, I, uh, I come up with all these different types of ideas for, like, the shirts, the hoodies, the, the hats, the, the pants, um, and, and then more stuff that I'm starting to branch off and try, you know, so that was, that's something that, you know, I became super passionate about. Um, and I've been invested a lot of my time and energy and, and effort into, and just want to like, you know, share that with the world, um, that creativity. And then more so because I'm such a, um, like motivating person. I love like, you know, motivating and, and, and I didn't want to just do it with just through the basketball. So this is my way to motivate as well. You know, like when you wear my stuff, I named it Evolve. You know what I mean? It's all about evolving. And if you just heard my story, you can see how I just evolved in life. You know what I mean? And it was all just me like working hard, um, not giving up. Um, constantly knowing that if I stayed stagnant, stayed in that same mindset of street life, I'd probably still be there. So I had to grow. I had to progress. I had to evolve. So I was like, that's why I chose my name. You know, because it, it hit it hit like with me personally. You know what I mean? I want that. And I, I know there's a lot of people out there who's going to resonate with that. You know what I mean? Like being in a certain place in life and just feeling like they're stuck and they stay, they, they, they just keep going and they keep trying and they, they, they get out of it. They start to just grow from that. So, um, so yeah. And besides that, being a family, man, you know, like that's my, uh, that, that's probably the main thing is, you know, I got my kids, got my wife. She's probably somewhere over there changing a diaper or something. But, um, but yeah, that's what it is now, man. Just trying to be a business business mogul um, and best father I can be. Got you, got you. So I'm a, I just got a few more questions for you. I'm a, I want yeah. to – But real quick, where do you see yourself in the next, like, three to five years? I know you got your clothing brand. You're still coaching and hooping. Mm -hmm. Where do you see yourself in the next, like, three to five years? Where can we expect to see what? Three to five years – I see, um, I see myself, one, I want to buy my first house. I haven't bought a house yet. That's a big goal of mine. Um, so we as a family want to get our first house together. Um, two, I, I just want to keep growing my business. You know, like I, I'm a firm believer. Of it, it takes that one, that one person. If I can get this to a, to a Kanye, if I can get this to a, a big celebrity, you know, if I can get something really fire to somebody, um, I'm going to take off. And that, I, I know it's going to happen. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going every single day. Um, I always post a lot of content. I'm, I'm, I'm always, you know, coming up with ideas. I can be sitting here on the phone with you right now on this Zoom. And I'm still like, 
what can I create now? You know, what can I do? My mind's always working like that. So I know it's going to be that, um, that one big thing that's going to help me, you know, just take off. Right. So that's, and, and I've grown and I've been, my business has been going, I started like a few months ago. Um, and I started with zero and now I'm at like 1100 followers, you know what I mean? So like that's growth alone. I haven't done advertising, um, you know, the paid stuff a lot. Like I, I got to still this, there's other levels I can tap into that's going to help me grow even more. So just continue to try to like, you know, um, grow my business. I want to be in the six figures as far as um, my following by that time, for sure. Um, I want to possibly be in like a store, you know, like a kith or like a big time, like a big time store, do some collabs with some big time companies. Um, so that's the thing. And then also along that, I, I feel like I'm going to start to branch off and try some more stuff, you know, some more, um, business ventures my of my own um so just just trying to see that happen and then you know get my little man into the into the game yeah. um i'll probably still stay coaching and training like I, I i'm gonna always that's my getaway from everything you need to get away from your own your own work like my own business um, you need to get away from family sometimes where you just need a break from family and just kind of be to yourself and have that peace of mind you know and that's that's the game for me. So I feel like I'm going to be that, that old uncle drew dude out there at 95 years old, still trying to give kids work. So, um, so yeah, that's what I see in the next few years, man. God willing. So I, I love your creativity and I know in the future you're going to have something real big. So hopefully in the next few months or the next year or so, we can get you back on the, art, on the podcast and see where you ended up at. Oh yeah, man. But at, at the end of every podcast, I ask my guests these three questions. So I'm going to ask you two questions, then, then we'll be done. So the first All right. What we got? But let me tell you. These three questions, when I ask people, they be like, damn, that's a good question. I don't know how to answer that. So we, we're going to see how you, how you come up with some answers for these questions. Um, so the first question is, what do you consider success? Everybody got their own opinion or uh, their own definition of what success is. What does success mean to you? Um... There's so many levels to success. Like, um, I have like my minor goals and, and big time goals. Like my minor success is launching my brand was, you know, something I've always wanted to do. I launched it. Getting a following, just having one person follow was success. Like anyone I can reach. You know what I mean? So I think success to everyone is different. Like a lot of us, um, not me personally, but a lot of people look at Instagram, the, the lifestyle they see celebrities live in, like they all weren't always in that position. And that's not everyone, that's not deemed successful. It shouldn't be successful for, for, for you. You know what I mean? Like a lot of them aren't even happy. They have all this money in the world, big houses, mansions. But you notice there's a lot of suicides and, and drug usage and all that, uh, drug addictions and stuff. So these people aren't even happy. I'm genuinely happy in the, in the position I'm in because I feel successful. You know what I mean? I, that doesn't mean I'm content. I want to get better. I want to grow. But I think success is something different to everybody. And what I deem success is just like those, those, those accomplishments that you've worked hard to get to. Like setting a goal for yourself. Uh, or, or, or visualizing like um, a dream or whatever it is, and then uh, attaining it, like reaching that. Um, and that for me is success. And that's not going to be the same for everybody else. Everybody else can say, well, brand's easy. I wanted to sell a million, a million products. Cool. That's just success. Me was starting my brand and trying to get a million products. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it depends. That, but that's how I look at it. All right, so the second question is, have you, have you seen the movie The Matrix? Yeah. I didn't see the other six of them, but I saw the first couple. The best one, though. The first one is the best one. But in the movie, when Morpheus confronts Neo about taking a red pill or blue pill, that's the question I want to ask you. If I confront mm -hmm. you right now and I say you can take the red pill, the red pill is you be exposed to all the truth, all the craziness and the chaos that goes on behind closed doors. Like, if you take this red pill, you're going to be exposed to all the truth going on in society. Okay. Blue pill, you know, you just, you know, live your life, you know, have your family, have your, your job, your career, and you don't got to worry about all that stuff that's going on behind closed doors if you take the blue pill. So would you take the red pill and be exposed to all the truth 
or would you take the blue pill and just, you know, lay low and you live your life? Um, that's a tough one, man, because I feel like I feel I feel like I want to take both pills. <laughs> like, what's going on? But I don't really care about that. Um, the reason the reason I say that is because, like you said, the the you got one pill, you know, showing what's going on, and, and I feel like we we should know the truth. We should know what's going on in our world and our society, um, because there's so much like shadiness going on, and it's so much so much that we can't prove, but we know. As weird as that sounds, and I just wish it was out. I wish it was out. You know what I mean? Like so, and I don't want to make this a political thing or, or a black white thing and all that kind of stuff. Um, but reality is like there's so much unfairness going on that I wish it could just be exposed. So that part of me wants that stuff out. You know what I mean? Because I I would be so selfish and naive and to act like I I don't care. I do because I know once that's out, we can make change. We can help. We can do better as a, as a society, you know, as, as a whole. And, and, and again, not just for my, my African-American people, but for everybody. You know what I mean? Like, I think that, uh, that's why I would want to know, but on the flip side, um, me and my, and my world, my, with my life, my family, my wife, my, 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 my kids, all that good stuff. Um, a lot of the stuff that society wants you to know, and that's out, it's, it's a distraction for your own, your own happiness, your own peace of mind. If I kept worrying about all that stuff, I'd be a wreck. I'd be stressed out. You know, like think about how stressed out we were all 2020. Every I never watched politics in my life, bro. I've never voted. I've never looked at presidents. I didn't know what democracy was. I wasn't into none of that stuff. This last year, I'm locked in CNN like this. I'm watching CNN. I don't watch CNN. I watch the other end, ESPN. You know what I mean? So, like, now I'm like, damn. And, and personally, that energy I spent watching this moron on my television all year, I could have been using that to create some for my brand. I could have been using that to spend time with my wife. I could have been using that to chase my son around. You know what I mean? Like, so I could have been using that energy towards for something else and not and not not so much negativity that that they want us to see they want us to know you know so like that's why for me that's 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 a tough question i usually can answer all the questions but like i gotta go like hey if i can't take both uh, half and half you're just gonna have to shoot my ass because like <laughs> that's a hard one man <laughs> i feel like all my all my guests have a, a struggle answering that question i would have a struggle answering that question too so it's all good it's all good that's a tough one that's a good question all right so the last question i got it's not a question it's a it's a statement or a message that i want you to leave to yourself watch this video five ten fifteen years from now what message would you want to leave him to watch or to hear i had to leave it for for who now leaving for myself Oh, if I have it, so this message I leave for myself to hear 15 years from now. Damn, you don't hit me with another banger. <laughs> what the hell do I want to tell myself now? So 15 years, you know what? This what, Wes? You're the fucking best. <laughs> You've always been the best. Just keep doing what you do. Um, that's a tough one, man. I, I don't even know how to answer that question. What would I want myself 15 years from now? I like like I, like on, on a more serious note, like I would just kind of speak to you know how far I've come, you know. Um like I was mentioning earlier, earlier in, in the podcast, um, how, how tough life was for me, man. Like I didn't even dive into a lot of the details, but, you know, just coming from, uh, you know, single parent home, uh, welfare, section eight, foster child, all that stuff to, to, to continue to progress in life and, and fight all those battles that I, that, that a lot of people would have, you know, given up on, you know, and just making it to where I made it so far and not being content that I'm here still wanting to keep going and going and going. And, um, 
I always, when I'm saying that stuff, Evolve always pops into my mind because it is me really evolving in life. And, and people always think I'm trying to plug my brand. But not in that moment. It's just like that's really what's happening. You know, it's really me like just evolving throughout life, um, taking on all the obstacles and all, all the all the all the tough times and just trying to, you know, make the most of it. But more so than that, speaking, you know, speaking to others and letting them know that, you know, you could do it. You know, you may feel like it's, it's, it's too hard or it's, too, it's, it's tough or you just want to give up. But if I had that attitude and I gave up back then, I would not be here right now. I wouldn't have my family right now. I wouldn't have like I own this, bro. You know what I mean? Like I didn't think I would own anything in life, you know, and, and that's what it's about. It's, it's about believing in yourself. So, um, Wes, shout out to you for fucking believing in yourself. Because if you didn't, you'll be a loser. You know what I mean? No offense to anybody who feels like they're a loser. But, like, you will be a fucking loser, man. Probably fucking down Hollywood with a Spider-Man suit doing backflips. Like, you feel me? Good thing you didn't do that, motherfucker. <laughs> Good thing you didn't do that. Hey, oh, but keep going. That's what I would say, God damn it. Man, you the best, man. Hey, I appreciate <laughs> Coming on the podcast, man. I appreciate you sharing your story with us. And I hope we can get you back on in the future, see where you end up, bro. I really appreciate you being on here. Hey, thanks for having me, bro. I, I like I said, man, I love what you're doing. I I uh I know we probably don't talk a lot, but I'm I watch everything, man. I'm always rooting for you, dude. Like you've been to China 17 times. I don't know why you keep going, but you've been there 17 times. You come back, you're running your own stuff, you've been sparking your own businesses. You've always had that mindset of, of being an entrepreneur. You've been doing it. You're giving back to the kids. Um, you're in tune with your with your with your with yourself. Yeah, you're, you're in tune with your culture. You see the you see the necklace? You feel me? So like I love it, man. And you were like that when we first met. That's why I've always like even, you know, we could have easily met there and then that been it. You know, we still stayed in contact when we got back to the States. Yeah. So I, I always appreciated you, your your passion and your character and everything. So for me, like, it's no problem. I was, as soon as you, as soon as you hit me, I was like, what time, what day? Let's do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And any way I can help, man, any way I can give back is let me know. Yeah, for sure, man. I, I always keep in contact with you and good luck with your brand and everything in your business. Everybody that's watching, all the viewers, go get some merch. Evolve. I'm going to shout you out. Evolve the label. I got so the much. On the way, get the hat, get the hoodie with your boy. Yes, sir. All right, for all my viewers, I want to thank y'all again for watching. If y'all haven't been updated, I'm now on the Apple Podcast app. So that app, the app that you got on your iPhone and your iPad. And all Big that, time. Go get at me, man. D-Max Podcast. Go search it up. Go listen to some podcasts. And I'm also on YouTube. So go check us out. All right, I want to thank everybody again. Go like, subscribe, and comment. And check your boy out. All right, peace. Peace.